uh, uh, watch uh, those and benefit from uh, them. So ETE is a brand that we're promoting because again, it's a focus of our institution and it's what we, uh, what we're, uh, what we do, we do, and something that we're very proud of. Uh, just by a show of hands, so that our group knows, could I uh, have those faculty who uh, are assigned to the Logan campus? Could I get you to raise your hands, please? Wonderful. I get uh, those faculty that, that that are assigned to Eastern, uh, the two Eastern campuses. Fantastic. About the faculty that are assigned to our regional campuses. Wonderful. Any online faculty that are out there in the digital world that maybe came to a day? We have a few of those. Of those but, well, great. W wonderful. I, it's now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Ab uh, Abby Banninghoff received her BS with dual majors in biochemistry and biology from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. She then completed her doctoral research in marine science with a specialization in comparative endocrinology at the University of Texas in Austin. At, at Austin in 2004. Dr. Benninghoff then worked as a postdoctoral research associate at Oregon State, where she received additional training in the areas of toxicology and carcinogenesis. Dr. Benninghoff is currently an associate professor in the Department of Animal, Dairy, and Veterinary Sciences for which she teaches courses in endocrinology and science communication. She is also a faculty member of the USU School of Veterinary Medicine, where she teaches components of veterinary physiology and directs the veterinary student research program. Dr. Benninghoff is, is an affiliate faculty member of the USTAR Applied Nutrition Research Program which has a research fo uh, which has a research focus on many things that I'm not going to try to pronounce because I didn't have a chance to read this before because I wasn't supposed to do this. <laughs> research is Dr. Benninghoff's lab. Uh, re research in Dr. Benninghoff's laboratory is multidisciplinary, co uh, covering topics ranging from dietary bi bioactives and cancer to toxicol. Uh, toxicology to genome uh, reprogramming. A major goal of Dr. Benninghoff's research program is to understand the influence of environmental factors on mechanisms of gene regulation in determining health and disease in animals and humans. Um, when uh, Dr. Benninghoff received the award uh, for uh, student mentor, uh, for 2016, uh, I just knew that she was someone that we had to ask uh, because that's what we do. Uh, we work with students, we teach students, and uh, her focus, and uh, although it's not mentioned here with her many uh, a wonderful uh, uh, accomplishments on the research side, she is known across campus and across the USU system for her ability to reach out to students to give them an, a, a fantastic experience beyond the classroom. And, and uh, it's, it's, we are pleased to have her here as our keynote speaker to have her here at Utah State University. And I'll turn the time over to her now. Would you please welcome her with, with applause? Thank you so much. And sorry for all the big words. <laughs> Good morning. That was a fantastic crowd. Um, I want to thank uh, Vice Provost w Robert Wagner for the kind introduction and for filling in unexpectedly. And I also want to take a moment, even though Provost Cockett could not be here this morning, to thank her for her mentorship and her support of my program and support of academic performance here at USU. I'd also, also thank uh, Dr. Wagner and Assistant Dean John and John for the invitation to speak to you today. I'm excited about this topic. If you listen to my bio, it sounds like, sounds like research, research, research. And my students would probably tell you, yeah, that's what 
my outward passion seems to be I'm a data junkie, but underlying that is the work with my students. I could go and do research anywhere else in the country, but what keeps me here at USU, what keeps me in, interested in academics is working with students. So I hope that some of that passion comes across this morning. I'd like to especially welcome you to the conference today and give a special uh, reception, a special welcome to our faculty who are from off the Logan campus. There are a lot of faces here that I don't recognize and it's exciting to have you visit us here on the main campus and I hope during the day today that I'll have a chance to meet some of you and learn about your experiences in teaching. So with that, I wanna tell you a little bit about how my presentation kinda of came together. When I uh, was first given the invitation by Robert and John, we talked a little bit about what do we mean by one-on-one -on -one instruction? What are the goals for this talk? What, are the, what falls under that umbrella? And over the course of the summer, we kept that dialogue going. And one day I had John come and visit me in my office and I had written out these notes um, about things that were spinning around in my head, topics that I wanted to share and talk with you about. And we talked for about an hour. And at the end of the hour, John looked at me and said, wow, there's a lot going on here. You've got a lot of ideas in your brain. Can you distill this down into one key thought, one key take home message that you'd like for your audience to walk away with? And that message is be deliberate in your one-on-one -on -one interactions with students. Be focused, be conscientious, be thoughtful. I think sometimes we give that thought to our classes. We give a lot of deliberate uh, instruction, a lot of deliberate attention to our in-class environments, whether it's a large lecture hall, a small classroom, a field experience or a lab experience. But if you really look at your heart, do you give that same level, level of deliberate attention when you're having a meeting with a student in your office? Or when you come across them on campus? Or when you're mentoring an honor fellow or someone on an internship? And I gave my, this is a lot of self-reflection. Today there'll be some confessions and lessons learned. But if we really give, give us a, that self-reflection, I think a lot of us would probably say, no, we're probably not as deliberate in our one-on-one -on -one interactions with students, our one-on-one -on -one instruction, as maybe we are with our classroom instruction. So today, I'm gonna take this take-home message and break it down into what I, I've devised of 10 key concepts that came out, came out from sessions with John and with others in my department, some colleagues elsewhere. So my goal for this hour is to convince you of the importance of being deliberate in your one-on-one -on -one interactions. So you, you heard about my biography focused on research, but I do a lot of teaching. So I teach three different courses. I'm really lucky in the nature of the courses that I teach. They're generally upper class, small class uh, size. My students almost universally want to be there. So some of you may have very different experiences, and I hope today that you'll pull me aside and let me know about your experiences with trying to get one-on-one -on -one interactions going when you're teaching 400 students at a time, or as I was just talking with another colleague, how do you make that happen when you're doing distance ed? So some of the types of one-on-one -on -one interactions that I engage with, of course, graduate student mentoring, that's a big focus of my time, and that's a perspective that I'll use a lot today. I'll talk a lot about the students I've worked with. I won't name any names. We'll just use a generic Bob here and there. Um, but they know who they are. They might be in the room. Uh, so I work a lot with graduate students. But students also have a lot of undergraduates. At one point last year, I think we had as many as 15 undergraduate students working in my research program on honors project internships as volunteers doing everything from washing dishes and entering data into a computer to running their own independent research and hopefully, if all goes well, authoring their own scientific paper. So that, that interaction, that instruction can span the gambit. I also direct students who are interested in internships. I work with students on a one-on-one -on -one -on -one basis in office hours, helping them with assignments. I work through workshops where students will come to me with presentations or writing samples that they're trying to improve. These are all similar ways that you can engage with students as well. So I, I, before we get going on these 10 key concepts, I have to pause and acknowledge the fact that I've been doing this for six and a half years. So that is not a long time. And so I'm, I'm talking about my insights, but I have to acknowledge that in this room, 
decades and decades worth of cumulative experience in education and instruction one-on-one. -on -one. And I hope that you will come find me today, find me afterwards, and tell me about your experiences and add to these 10 key concepts. Help expand them, bring your experiences to make this more comprehensive. So today, I'm just, my goal is to get the conversation started. So the very first one is probably the most obvious, and that's be available. It's logical, right? You can't have one-on-one -on -one instructions, one-on-one -on -one interactions, if you're not making yourself available to those students. My suggestion to you is, of course, dedicate time to one-on-one -on -one instruction and outline this in your course syllabus. Let your students know what your plans are for making yourself available to work with your students one-on-one. -on -one. Now, also obvious, um, for most of us who've been teaching for a while, we set aside office hours for this purpose, a dedicated time during the week where you're supposed to have nothing else on your plate, you're supposed to clean, you know, turn off your data, put the email away, and make yourself available to focus on student needs. Now, how many of you have students regularly come to your office hours, that you just have a line of students out the door and you never feel like you get through them all? Yeah, <laughs> that's my experience too. How many feel like students just never come? They just don't take advantage of it. They, they, they don't really come and see you. So that, that was my feeling about two or three years ago. I got really frustrated. I put aside two or three hours every week. I put the email away. I didn't do my data analysis. And I reserved that time for students and they never came. And I got depressed and I, and I said, if you guys aren't gonna use this time, I won't carve it out, and I'll make appointments for those who are interested. Well, that's a barrier. And so confession, that was a bad idea. So I've turned that around, and now I'm trying to devise ideas to make myself more available. Can we identify strategies to incentivize students using that availability time? So maybe instead of calling it an office hour, call it an availability hour. So some options. Just me brainstorming, make it part of your assignment, part of the assessment for your course that a student needs to come and consult with you. Maybe they come after their first exam and they need to make an appointment, they need to come during office hours to review their exam no matter how well they did. Or if you have a writing assignment in the class, they have to consult with you face to face on the writing topic or go over a brief abstract, an outline for the paper. These are, if you put it as part of the assessment for their course performance that they need to come see you, then they're gonna come see you if they wanna complete, you know, get full points for that assessment. There are other ways you might incentivize um, students coming and interacting with you. This is definitely something on my mind, because my nephew, he's 18 and starting at University of Maryland College Park in about two weeks. So <laughs> we have one alum here. <laughs> so he asked me, you know, what's your biggest piece of advice? I said, go meet your professors. I don't care if you don't have any questions about the syllabus. Go and introduce yourself to the professors. So one way you can help your students maybe use that time is tell them, you don't have to have a question. You don't have to have a problem to come and see me. So think about strategies for students to come and use that time. There are other things that you can do that you may not have considered, especially if you're a relatively new faculty member or if you're one of our graduate students and are thinking about your future in academia. Host a student honors project or an internship. A student may not realize that you're willing to be a mentor, that you're willing to engage in that one-on-one -on -one instruction with them if you don't tell them in the first place. So if you wait for a student to come and tell you, hey, I want to do an honors project with you, there may be others in the room who are considering it or maybe who hadn't really even thought about doing something like that because they're a little nervous about coming and talking to you. Let them know in your course introduction, put it in your syllabus, I'm willing to advise a select number of students on an internship or an honors project. Invite students to participate in your scholarly work. A lot of us have dual roles. Myself, I, I do a lot of research and I teach. I invite students to participate at a lot of different levels. I described before anything from washing dishes to running their own independent research that will be published in the scientific literature. So I've invited those students to participate. They could get involved in a research lab like mine, in the field, in the library. There are a lot of opportunities. A student, if you're doing humanities research, could help search the literature, retrieve articles from the barn, 
go into the community, do surveys. There are a lot of different ways you can bring students involved in your scholarly research. Don't be afraid to try that. Most important is, is to maintain an attitude of availability. So here's my first confession. Now, I'm generally not shy about telling lessons learned. So my students, I, I keep a fairly open door policy. My students will come down the hall and my, I have semi-transparent walls so I can see a shadow and they'll hover outside my door and I'm facing this way looking at my computer and I see the shadow back here. And apparently they told me I, I, I would be so focused and I'd see the shadow, I'd huff. Like, oh, I'm being interrupted again. I'd be, oh. <laughs> it was subconscious. I had no idea I was doing this. But it sent them a signal that I really wasn't welcoming them. I wasn't making myself available. And it became a running joke. It, it was like, oh, sorry to interrupt you. I really, I really don't want to bother you. But I have this urgent need that I need you to address. So I hope, and you can ask them later today if we've been successful. We talked and tried to devise a policy or a, a signal that I could give them when I really did need to be focused, because there are times when you've, you've got a deadline and you've got to get that paper done and you've done and you grade those exams. My door is shut. That means don't knock. Don't bother me unless the building is burning down. Um, and even then, you should be running out the building, not trying to find me. So if the door is shut, don't bother me. Bother me. But otherwise, I try and not do that subconscious signal when they come to see me. I put the material away and I give them my attention because I've given them the signal that I'm available to them. So think about anything subconscious that you might do that might suggest to your students that you're not really available. You're, you're not really giving them that opportunity to see you. And then try and project that attitude of being available. So the second is to help students feel comfortable. We need to keep in mind that one-on-one -on -one instruction, one-on-one -on -one interactions can be incredibly intimidating for some students. Our students run the gambit from type A extroverted personalities. I kind of put myself in that situation. I can talk the bark off a tree. It's not a problem for me. I can talk to pretty much anybody. But there are students who are the opposite, who have a hard time breaking that barrier. Imagine a scenario where you're an introverted, you're shy, not terribly confident, and you need to go see your professor and is in this fancy office on the top floor of the building. You, you stop by the office and the desk is piled high with papers and maybe even the computer monitor setup they have is between you and the student. It's very intimidating sitting across that desk. You have to keep in mind that power relationship that exists when a student is sitting across that desk. And that creates barriers for students, and it's especially a problem for students who don't have that confidence. So bad that there are situations where students' fear of going to see their professor prevents them, even when they have dire circumstances or failing class, not showing up, something personally horrible in their life is going on. So how can we help remove those barriers and make students feel more comfortable in some of those one-on-one -on -one interactions? My suggestion is consider relocating your meetings. Get out of the office. Call it an availability hour. There are locations on this campus where you can go camp for a couple hours and make yourself available to the students. A table in the library, the cafe, the hub. It's really nice outside right now. A corner on, corner on the quad where you can tell students, hey, I'll be at this location. Come see me there. And the advantage of those locations is that you remove yourself from your office, you reduce that, you know, kind of eliminate that power structure, and then you're sitting side by side with someone and not across. And I think that might help you engage better with those students. And it can really help those students feel more comfortable. So another thing that you can do is tell students what they might expect in that first one-on-one -on -one meeting. Tell them the kind of questions you might ask. So I'd like my students to come see me. Some of the things I'll ask them, what are your ambitions? What do you want to get out of this class? What are, you, what are your plans after you graduate? Because I'm teaching mostly senior and then some graduate students. What can I help you with? So if a student knows that they may be asked what they want to do with the rest of their life, then they can maybe think about that question a little bit and come in prepared. Or if I'm going to ask them, do you have questions about this assignment? Do you understand the nature of the assignment? They can be prepared and have reviewed the assignment in advance. Also, if you are, in, are encouraging students to come to see you um, to consult on materials, let's say to review 
an essay question or review a particular article or have listened to a news story, give them that material ahead of time so that they can be prepared. So knowing what to expect can help reduce those barriers as well. Then lastly, I say, you know, I'm sure most of you have experienced this, the pre and post class scrum, where the students assault you, not literally, um, they come and they just glom onto you right when you're getting your presentation on the monitor, the monitor. you've only got a few minutes to get your, your materials up, you're reviewing things and getting prepared to lecture. And the students come, I have a question about this test, or I don't understand this assignment, and they're trying to get attention in that few minutes where you're not focused on them. The same thing happens after class. Are they, I didn't understand this point, or can you explain this figure? But, you, but you've got to take the space for the next group that's coming in. So those are both bad periods to try and focus on a student. It's just, it would be superficial attention. So one strategy I use, I schedule my availability hours directly after class so that I can say to a student, because I get most of my questions after class, like, hey, let's talk about this up in my office. Let's go meet upstairs, get a cup of coffee or a soda, and let's sit and talk about this where I can give you my full attention. So if you have that option where you can schedule that availability time to coincide with your class, I think that will help you give more direct and focused attention to your students. Okay, so then the next perhaps also seems obvious, but if we really dissect the idea of what it means to be a model for our students, you might realize there's some things you haven't given a lot of thought about before. So we want to demonstrate the values and the traits that we want our students to embody. So as a scientist, as a researcher, it's important for me to demonstrate the traits I want my students to develop over time. Some of the things, the things that first mind is enthusiasm, hope that my students get that I'm enthusiastic about the work that we're doing, that I love my job and I love what I do with them. The diligence, you know, pay attention to details, do things right, not quick. Um, perseverance and pushing through and problems happen and you know, they happen a lot. That's, research is just a whole series of problems. Then ethics, doing things the right way, being honest about your work. These are four key traits not related to any specific scientific skill, but professional traits that I want my students to embody. So the question that you should ask yourself in your profession, in your discipline, what are the traits of your profession that you want, you want your students to emulate? And then be a model for those traits. You will serve as the most immediate example of professional behavior for your discipline for those students, especially during those one-on-one -on -one interactions. So in my field, keeping up with the latest scientific literature is a key trait. Knowing the most recent discoveries, who's doing the most impactful work. These are all things that I want my, I want my students to do on a regular basis. Now, I admit, again, another confession, I'm not the best at keeping up with the latest papers. That's something I'd struggle to find time for. But if I try and convince my students this is really important, and some of them are on the ball, they're fantastic bringing me stuff all, every week, that's me demonstrating to them that that's important. Hopefully, they'll adopt that trait as well. You also, also want to sure that you follow USU rules and guidelines for the workplace. So you're, if you're a new faculty, you're going to get a lot of this in the next couple of weeks. So I'm just going to keep it really brief. For example, the USU policy on sexual harassment in the workplace. If you want your stu students to follow that policy, and all our students are supposed to have that training, then you need to follow that, follow that policy. You need to be a model for good ethics, good responsible behavior in the workplace. Particularly relevant for my discipline is responsible conduct, conduct of reach. So scholarly activity, there is a whole set of guidelines for all disciplines that govern how we pursue our scholarly activity, covering everything from using uh, human or animal subjects, plagiarism, authorship, grantsmanship, all of these things are covered. Again, be a model, do it the right way, and your, and your students follow. So we also want to model appropriate behavior in response to challenges or crises. When things go wrong, the way we respond to those problems serves as a model for how our students can respond. And here's a, another story for you. So my graduate mentor 
was a, is, is, he's still alive, a brilliant man, the best in his field, and I am the scientist I am today because of his mentorship. And I want to get that out of the way because what I'm going to say next is pretty negative. And I, we learn from our models both good and bad, right? I've learned how to be a good communicator, a good writer, a uh, good statistician from my experience with my mentor. But what I learned negative was how not to respond in times of crisis. So the, the general sense for my mentor was any problem, fair, whether very significant versus small, he adopted this attitude of the sky is falling. I heard him more than once say, I'm going to have to shut this lab down for something, you know, the, at one point our institutional overhead rate went up. Oh, I'm going to have to shut this lab down. We did have a hurricane come through and kill all of our fish, so I was doing marine science. Yeah, at that moment, you know, it's not a great day. I'm going to have to shut this lab down. But that attitude trickled down into the students he worked with. And so I'm literally walking around thinking, my research is going to, is going to end. What am I going to do next? Where am I going to finish my degree? So it created fear and anxiety in me when I heard, I'm going to have to shut this lab down. Or you guys are spending way too much money. And I, I, it's, it's, problems just became really big. So the, what I've learned to not do is react in that kind of way in front of my students. And we have our challenges. We have our problems. We've dealt with some recently. I'll give an example on those a little later. Try and emulate the kind of professionalism you want for the people that you're working with. When something bad happens, try not to be terribly negative right out the get-go. Get -go. That will impact your perception of your students. So one of the things that we might not do um, with our one-on-one -on -one instruction that we probably do do with our classrooms, at least I hope you do, is objectives, is set specific objectives. Obviously, we all, with our course, have our idea objectives, and then we probably have more specific content-related objectives. How many of you have ever set individual objectives for students who come and see regularly in your office hours, or students that you're working, on, working with on an honors project or an internship? A few. So this is something I've been giving thought to a little bit more over the summer as I've developed this seminar. There are opportunities for us to set individual goals, individual objectives for students, even in relatively um, minor one-on-one -on -one interaction actions during that office hour, that availability hour. You can set objectives, set benchmarks for those students for making progress. For one example, let's say you have a, a class that's discussion heavy. Let's take my science and a society honors course. That class, if you're quiet and introverted, is a really tough class for you because every day I hope to hear, expect to hear from every student and if you're, if you're just not very vocal, it's hard for you to get all the points and all the credit for participation. So let's say I had a student, Jackie, and Jackie was having a really hard time getting going on that. I'd ask her to come see me in my availability hour and say, okay, so this is a challenge for you. Let's set a goal. In the next month, at least one class a week, ask a question or make a point. Then after that month, we'd revisit and say, hey, how did it go? Did you, did you feel good about asking those questions? All right, let's step it up. Next, for the next month, you lead a discussion point. I'll, I'll let you pick the point, but you come prepared to lead that class discussion. And hopefully by the end of the term, if they've made progress on these individual goals, they'll have finally got to the point where they don't need the prodding, don't need those benchmarks from you to get going on discussion. Another thing to consider in that scenario is documenting that interaction. If you, if you and collaborate on setting, setting those goals together and the student makes progress and you've documented that progress, imagine what it would be like writing the letter of recommendation for that student for the honors program or for an internship that, that she's interested in. You'll have documentation of that student setting goals, acting on those goals, and meeting them. That's going to be a really nice letter when you're able to write that. So another type of objective, objective that's set for a one-on-one -on -one would be subject-oriented. So you may have a student that wants, that wants to come to your research program, come into your uh, office and learn a specific skill. Maybe for my group, confocal microscopy, 
or animal husbandry might be a specific skill that they want to learn. In another discipline, let's say in music, they want to learn how to sing with perfection in a certain aria. That's their goal. It's subject-oriented. But these goals can also be behavior-oriented, kind of like the one I just described, learning how to interact in class more, be more pro proactive in discussions, and, um, answering questions with poise, uh, with competence and competence. Those are some behavioral objectives that aren't related to your subject, and skills earned in that area can translate to their other classes. So those are things that you can develop. Another trick you might consider is developing basic rubrics that you can use one-on-one. -on -one. So I have two rubrics that I use in my science communication class, one for presentations and one for science writing. They're not just exclusive to that class. They, they could be any type of scenario in my discipline. So if I have a student who's giving me a writing assignment, I can print, uh, or the first version of their scientific paper or their thesis, I can pull out that rubric and say, hey, this area we're having trouble with, and you can use those one-on-one. -on -one. But maybe you, you don't really have a rubric in place for some other types of activities. Let's say you have a student who's interested in doing work in the field with you. Let's say um, you're a herpetologist and you're collecting rattlesnakes in southern Utah. And part of the, the assessment of, of a student performance, let's say you have a student who's working as an intern to come and help you collect those rattlesnakes. And they're expected to be on time. They're expected to be prepared, have all the materials they need. They're expected to wear the proper personal protective equipment. So, you know, boots, jeans, whatever else you use to protect yourself from snakes. I don't know, I don't work with snakes. Um, and they're expected to be diligent in their work. So there, right there are four criteria that you can just simply say, you know, good job, adequate job, did not complete, and give that feedback to the students so that they're aware that you know that they're doing their job well or not. So you, the idea of using a rubric on an individual basis, especially if you work with a lot of people, can seem daunting. It's like, oh, man, another rubric. But it doesn't have to be. It can be done periodically, and it can be fairly simple. But generally, I, I want to reiterate the idea that if you set individual goals and try and align those goals with the students' aspirations and their skills, then you can really help set that student on a path for success. And you'll also have a record, especially if you document this as you go, that will help you write really strong letters of recommendation and get that student into the next posting, into the next job opportunity, or the next school that they really want to go to. Once those goals are set, of course, you need to maintain expectations, and that's holding students to account. If you set these benchmarks, then your expectation is that the student, if they have the right training and the right supervision, will, will reach those benchmarks. You would use these benchmarks just like you would a formal class. Formal class. You know, your assessment there would be there would be an or grading an essay, other types of assessment. So you need to do the same here on an individual basis. If a student is not meeting those benchmarks, then you do want to apply consequences. So let's use that example of the student who's a, her a budding herpetologist that's gone down to southern Utah to collect rattlesnakes. I don't even know. Are there rattlesnakes in southern Utah? OK. I know there are in Texas. <laughs> I assume there are in southern Utah. So you have a student who shows up in cargo shorts and flip-flops and who left their lab notebook behind and didn't, re didn't read the protocol that day. That student's clearly not meeting expect expectations. What would be the proper course of action? From a safety perspective, that student shouldn't participate. You put him back in the car and tell him to go home. And then hopefully the next week, meet with them and discuss why. Like, why did we take this action? It's like, you weren't prepared. What do you need to do to try and help this? You, maybe you reevaluate your goals of the student. You develop new strategies. Maybe that student needs a checkoff sheet to help them be prepared. Maybe you didn't tell them that they needed to wear jeans and boots. Maybe you forgot to tell them that. So maybe the problem was not having the right training. But use those consequences, because otherwise students are they're not going to meet the next benchmark. So another incredibly important a uh, key point here is trust but verify. This is essential in my program. 
You are taking a leap of faith when you invite students to engage in scholarly activity, when you invite them to internships and invite them to participate. Again, using the example of the herpetologist, you may be counted on Bob to be there that day to help you capture those snakes. And now you're short a person. So you do have to put your trust. One-on-one -on -one instruction really does give a tremendous opportunity for students to learn independently. But students have to be well-trained in the principles and ethics of their discipline to do that work. And then you have to follow up with trust earned through that verification, through you verifying the students are executing their work correctly and that the results that they're getting are good. So that verification is really important. So for example, again in my field, let's say I have an undergraduate student help me on one of my cancer studies. And it turns out the student didn't calculate the area of a tumor correctly. They used the wrong formula. And I didn't catch it, nobody else caught it. And I put that data in my presentation, then put that data in my paper, and then heaven help me, what if somebody at the FDA or the National Cancer Institute makes, makes a policy decision based off my data? Or if somebody else tries to replicate my work and they can't, and now I've, I'm being called to task. Well, let's see your raw data. I go and look and say, oh my gosh, my student used pi over something instead of pi, pi over four instead of pi over six. It's a disaster. And that fault is with me because I didn't go back and verify that work. So that verification is incredibly important. So then let's take the scenario, what happens when that verification reveals a problem, when a mistake is identified? And this, I have found in my short experience, is the point where one-on-one -on -one interactions can really go downhill, where, where if it's a bad experience, that student can be tainted and will leave your discipline, will go do something else, won't ever come back. So it's critical that we get these interactions right. So I'm gonna use an example that happened just last Friday. I was at a department lunch. I get a call on my cell phone, which if I get a call on my cell phone, that's bad. It means something went wrong. So I see the student's name, I pick up the phone, and she's in a panic an utter panic, and I can tell that it's bad. So I um, try not to use names. Uh, Amy, we'll call her Amy, tells me on the phone, I've made a horrible mistake. I don't know what to do. I don't know what happened. I, 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 you've got to come and talk to me about this. So I told her, okay, I'll be up there in about 10 minutes. minutes. We'll come and talk. So came into the lab, and I could tell the student was in a panic and asked her what happened. And it was a it was, you know, simple mistake. I didn't charge at her. I didn't say, how did you make a mistake? Or, oh my gosh, this is going to cost our lab $25,000. Because that's kind of what we were looking at. If it was really, really bad, we already had the study started. And this reagent was really important. And if it failed, there it goes, you know, I looked at the budget, $25,000. And so it could have been a disaster. And the student knew this. So she was panicking. We were really lucky as we talked through what had happened and we looked at our resources and calmly walked through things, we actually were able to come up with a solution. And luckily the study's going on and we have no problems, thank God. But sometimes you're not gonna be lucky and sometimes that mistake will have real financial consequences or real consequences in other areas. That interaction, that student, I mean that student is feeling a really big weight of responsibility. I've trusted her to do that work. I've trained her, I thought, well, it's not gonna help for me to berate the student or to accuse them of destroying a study that's $25,000 or failing on their PhD program. So I thought about that interaction and, and how I handled that situation. And there've been quite a few of those, well, not quite a few, three or four of those in my experience where it was a pivotal moment and the theme that I came up with was first think about the cause. What's the source of the problem? Is it the student didn't understand the procedure? They didn't understand the instructions, what they were supposed to be doing? Were they distracted? Were there other things going on academically, personally, professionally that kept them from keeping their focus on their work? Was it a lack of experience? Did you expect the student to make inferences or use their judgment to one end when they didn't really have the experience to get them there. 
So all of those things, a lack of training, a lack of experience, and a problem with focus can be addressed through more deliberate, direct interactions with our students. So as part of this discussion with Amy, I asked her, what do you think happened? This is a really, it was a really simple mistake, just a you know, brain meltdown. And we learned she hadn't written on a protocol for what was something you generally we think, you know, mix two chemicals together, you divide them up, miss, easy peasy. I've been doing that since freshman chemistry 101. Well, well the student didn't have this protocol written down in a stepwise fashion. She made a simple mistake. So what do we learn? How can we learn from this mistake, establish new procedures so it doesn't happen again? So the next time I come around to verify something, we're good. So, what, so think about the next time you interact with a student, what was the source of the problem, what did you learn from that experience, and what concrete steps can you take to prevent that from happening again? If, if we're effective in our one-on-one -on -one interactions, we can help students develop these skills so that when a mistake happens, they can self-analyze and devise strategies to handle those problems in the future. Because you know, today, I have to do that for myself. And so if we want our students to be critical thinkers, to be independent, and that, you know, that's a goal of a lot of one-on-one -on -one instruction, helping them evaluate these problems is a good step. Individual feedback, huge element of one-on-one -on -one instruction. And we don't give grade, give grade during office hours. I don't give my student a grade for how she performs in the laboratory. I don't really give grades for honors projects or internships. So we have to find other mechanisms for giving that individual feedback. It's necessary for those students to gauge the progress in our goals, to know if they're meeting their expectations. So this can be as casual as a verbal critique. A student comes in with an essay that they're revising and you've been working on it, you can give them verbal critique, say, you know, you've done really well in paragraph one, I see you've accepted the changes that I marked, but I need you to learn from those, those errors that I marked and, and fixed for you and apply that through the rest of the essay so that you can learn the skills for editing on your own and not just let me do it for you. That's a verbal critique that can work really well. Or a student who's trying to participate more in class Come, you know, come prepared with a question instead of trying to think of one on the spot. Or a student who's struggling coming up with a really good essay answer on a test. Suggest to them, try writing an outline before you tackle the essay. Answer the essay question first before you do the rest of the test. These are verbal critiques that you can give back verbal, uh, and, and students for, for improvement. You can also use written critiques. If you're going to go with a rubric, you can use that rubric to give them suggestions. But my goal every time I'm working with a student is to some, have some element of feedback for that student so that they know how they're progressing, so that they get a sense of whether they're meeting those goals. One student that I've been working with, um, let's call him Bob, he started as an undergraduate with me. Uh, we were doing a, a, I don't know if it was an honors project or just undergraduate research. And he learned, he learned how to collect data and put data together in a figure. Once he became a master's student in my lab, we needed to step up his game, get him actually interpreting his data. And so one of the critiques that I gave him is don't just come to me with a figure, come to me with an interpretation. Tell me what that means instead of expecting me to tell you what that means. So that's an example of how critique can help that student evolve over the course of your one-on-one -on -one instruction. Make every interaction count. So every time you're working one-on-one -on -one with a student is an opportunity for that student to have a, a positive experience, to make progress on their goals, or the opposite can happen. happen. You have a negative, a negative experience. So I wanted to ask the audience, think about something in your college training, a time that you were working with an instructor or a mentor. Just the, just an, an, an experience, something you remember, a meeting in the hallway, a meeting in your office, talking about your thesis. Okay, everybody has something in mind? How, for how many of you is that a negative experience? Something, a critique or seek or something kind of hit you right here? Wow, not as many as I thought. I must be really different or else you guys aren't really sharing. Um, <laughs> I tend to focus on negative things. I'm a type A personality. I tend to be really perfectionist, perhaps to the point of OCD. 
And I've, I center on negative things. As an example, I sang the Bach B minor mass oh, about two weeks ago with Dr. Jessup at the Ellen Eccles. And what my brain has been focused on for the past two weeks are four notes I would give anything to have back. Back Came in a measure too early. I was a little too confident trying to help out my section, and I came in too early, and it ruined it. That's my perspective. I talked with Dr. Jessup after the concert and said, oh, man, did you hear me come? And I'm so sorry. I messed up those four notes. Why are you worried about that? You sang thousands of notes perfectly. Don't focus on the fourth. Don't focus on the thousands. You have to understand that some students, apparently you guys are all like optimists, glass half full folks. That's great. We need a world full of those people. But some of your students are going to be like me, and they're going to take a critique, a, a poorly chosen word, or, or a negative experience, you know, the sky is falling type experience. They're going to take that to heart, and it really could taint them. It could really impact them for the rest of their career. So we have to be cognizant of how, of how it affects students. Definitely give feedback, but be aware of how the students might be affected. So I'm going to share with you a personal anecdote that I've not shared with anybody ever. So this is a big step for me. And I, you know, I hope you'll appreciate that. When I was an undergraduate, I started doing research my junior year. I worked for the department head in my department. And it was an OK experience. I decided not to become a professional biochemist because of that experience. You know, big cinder block lab, nobody in there. I never saw the sun for two years. And so I said, nah, I'm going to go play with animals in the ocean. So that's why I went and did a PhD in marine science. But there was value in that experience because I learned I love research. And I overall, I felt like it was a fairly good experience. As part of that training, we got formal feedback. So this, is, this wasn't just only one student at a time. It was a class of students. They were all trained together, and we picked labs. The program director had each mentor, each person who worked with us one-on-one, -on -one, give us feedback. And I will never forget, and I wrote the words out here, so I'll say them specifically. My mentor, who admittedly I didn't interact with a whole lot because he was the department head and really busy, he said, this student seems a bit arrogant, but more research experience should blunt this trait. <laughs> now, that word arrogant, this is a big deal for me to share, that hurt. It hurt personally because that's a trait I really don't like in other people. And I now have somebody who I respected and whose good opinion I craved, who I asked to write letters of recommendation, is telling me, and that's all that was said, nothing personal, nothing one-on-one -on -one to me, is telling me that I came across as arrogant. And uh, that word haunts me to this day. I could fairly consistently think of how I come across to others. And I, if I come across you as arrogant, please don't, please don't tell me really. Right now is not a good time. <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, give it a year, and then we'll talk. Uh, but it really it maybe changed how I behaved. Now, looking at this 20 plus years back, so it's been two decades, thinking I was one of maybe two women in this program. There was not a single, single female faculty member in that department that I can recall. Maybe what, 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 my, uh, what was perceived as arrogant was actually assertiveness and ambition and enthusiasm that came across to somebody who hadn't been around a lot of women like me as arrogant. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe there was something I did that came across a little too hoity-toity. Maybe, maybe there was something specific. But the problem here is that that faculty member never gave me any context, never explained a specific example, never gave me suggestions for how I could improve, just the word arrogant. And that's a negative experience that stuck with me for my life. So you guys are all glass half full people, so that would never bother you, right? Except for the few hands I saw back here. But you have to keep in mind that the words you choose, the way you choose to deliver your feedback, could really have an impact. And it's pretty remarkable to think I remember the exact moment. I remember where I was standing when I read those words. And it sticks with me today. So that's. My, uh, my sharing for you is an example, hopefully, of what not to do. You, al you also need to be aware. Our students, 
are facing a lot of challenges, not just in their academics, um, but also personally, personally and in their community. So we need to be emotionally available. We need to be sensitive to uh, signals of problems that could affect learning, comprehension, and performance. And one thing, before I got to USU, I had not given a lot of attention to were signs of dis learning disabilities. And, and across in some of my students, college is sometimes the first place where we really start seeing those signs, especially if a student hadn't been really strongly challenged early on. If this is the first time they're facing challenges because of the learning environment or the amounts of material that they're trying to read. And I remember a colleague of mine, um, he and I both taught the same student in different classes. And this student had come to talk to me about his learning disability, and we made accommodations and made it work. But my colleague was shocked at the end of the term when he finally found out about this disability. And the student had never gone to him and explained it, and so there weren't accommodations. And in respect, my colleague recognized, oh, these were the signs. I wish I was more aware at the time. So learn those signs and be aware. Uh, be cognizant about how external events can affect our students, and don't be afraid to address these. So this has happened a couple of times in my teaching here. Unfortunately, some fairly recently. After the shooting in Orlando, that I think the next day, I had a group meeting with my laboratory. And this was weighing on my heart, as I'm sure it was weighing on yours. And I thought, these students might not have had an opportunity to talk about it. So I told them, you know, if you want to come talk, if you have a concern, you can go to uh, our counseling services on campus. But my door is open, too, and you can come talk with me. And I found out after the fact, when the student came to see me, that that meant the world for her because she was a member of that community. And really had, I mean, the students, I didn't know. But being emotionally aware, being sensitive to the impact external events can have on our students can be incredibly important. Some of those, it could be financial stress. A student might not be able to afford your textbook. So be cognizant of that. Personal stresses, I mean, you, you date people, you break up with people, you get married, you have problems. All this is going on at the same time you're trying to learn the structure of a steroid hormone. It can be really, really challenging. If your student is a member of an underrepresented group on campus, provide to them information for resources. So on campus, we have Allies on Campus is a group that serves our LGBT community. We have several student unions for members of minority ethnic groups, including an Asian, Black, Latino, Native American, and Polynesian uh, student unions. We also have on campus the USU Center for Women and Gender, which can help women um, dealing with challenges in an academic environment. But my take home point for you here, in terms of being aware, is when a student needs you, find the time to be there for them. For them. If you can't, point them in the right direction. You may be the last step. You may be their last best hope for getting help. You may be the person who sees the signs of problems. Their family are at home, their, room, their roommates two hours a day. You may see them more than anybody else. I see my graduate students probably more than, than anyone else that they see. Be aware and be emotionally available. And I'll share, hopefully I'm doing okay on time. So I'll share another anecdote. This is one that I call, that is a good one. I hold, I hold my heart. I had a student, we'll call her um, Jane. She was an undergraduate student working with me. She wanted to just get experience doing something in the lab. And she came to me one day and said, I need an hour of your time. I said, OK, I'll well, we'll set an appointment. So we set an appointment, closed the door. She came in, sat down in the chair. And she said, how do you reconcile science and God? Whoa, I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting a question about a lab protocol or a class. class. That threw me for a loop. How do you reconcile science and God? So I'm a scientist. And, and scientists, we, we might, might be uncomfortable talking about faith. Faith, also not from Utah. I'm originally from Tennessee. And I'm very sensitive to the fact that faith is a very large part of the Utah culture. And aware of that being a, a big part a big uh, part of my students' lives. And so I want to be respectful. And I have a student coming, how do you reconcile science and God? So 
For some people, their initial reaction is, well, I, you know, I'm not comfortable talking about that. Uh, it's, it's, I don't think I should talk about that. Maybe I'll get in trouble, trouble if I say thing and your mom calls the president of the university and, uh, and I'm pre-tenure and I just don't want to you know, go down that road. So that could have been one reaction. But what I asked her is, why is, this, why is this question on your mind? And what was going on, her family had a very strong, very conservative faith that was clashing with some of the things she was learning in science. Yet she loved science. She loved the, the idea of discovery. She loved what she was doing, doing. And so she had these two interests, her family interest and perhaps a career interest, hitting head to head. And she just needed to, needed to talk to somebody to work through it. And luckily, I had made myself appear available. You know, I kept that attitude of available, availability, letting my students come see me. We set an appointment, and we didn't talk for just one hour. I think she was in my office for hours and hours, and we talked through it. And it was, I told her these are my personal thoughts. We talked through it, and at the end, I asked her, so I've told you what I think. You've talked to your parents. But the important thing is you, you coming to your own vision. Okay, and I will do whatever I can to help facilitate you coming to, to the choice that's right for you. Today, she works at the uh, Utah Public Health Department. So she completed a degree in a science field and is now in a science-related profession. And she is in on excellent terms with her family. And I really do think that that conversation, that being aware, being available to that student, helped her talk through it, helped her rationalize and make sense out of these conflicting views. And that has been one of the best experiences I've had on campus. And that experience, that experience so really drove my interest in developing this honors course on science and society. The idea that we can talk about societal issues that might be controversial and talk about science at the same time without fear. So let's move on. Of course, one-on-one -on -one instruction is a excellent way to build professional relationships. And these students that you're teaching, that you're working with on a project, that, you're helping, that are helping you with your scholarly activity, they could become your employees, your colleagues, members of your community, your neighbors in the future. So it behooves us to do a good job at this and to treat them with respect. So building those professional relationships also might involve being a little personal with students. So it doesn't hurt to let your students get to know you a little bit, bit. I let my students all know that I sing. I sing in the American Festival Chorus, although I don't do solos. Um, I enjoy hiking. I have two dogs. They hear a lot about my dogs. And you know my students tend to be in the animal science department, so they like animals too, so that's generally something we share in a common interest. But I don't worry about my students getting to know me a little bit in terms of my personal interests. I want to know their personal interests too. A couple of my students have come to concerts. A couple of students have looked into other activities that we might share. I think that's great. It helps you engage with students outside of the class material and help that engagement maybe feel more comfortable when you really do have to talk about the data or the writing or the performance on the exam. So that's kind of something I do at the start of class, it's something I do when a student comes in to meet with me in my office. Like, hey, what did you do last weekend? You know, what cool experience did you have over the summer? And I think that also really helps break down barriers. Um, that said, sometimes we need boundaries. So we're talking also professional relationships. So one boundary I do set, I don't Facebook anybody I've ever taught. It's just the, I feel comfortable with that, and I understand my students keep trying to friend me on Facebook. I'm like, no, I don't. I want to be my own person in that environment. I don't really want to worry about what I say there and how it's going to influence uh, professional. So I keep, you know, Facebook's its own little bubble. Nothing work-related, nothing student-related. You might like to do the same thing. But then again, you might give your students your cell phone number and let them text you at 4 a.m. That's up to you. That's kind of nuts, but some, some, some faculty go to that, that length. Sometimes those kind of, the, the, the boundaries that differ depending on the level of interaction. My graduate students do have my number because sometimes if my lab is burning down at 4 a.m., I would like to know. I, I think you know, at least to watch it. 
You know, might not be able to run in there and rescue anything, but it would be a good bonfire. Um, so some, set the boundaries that you need to. Don't worry about that. Other ways that we can build those relationships. One, I think, graduation. So I adore graduation. I love going, and I'm sometimes disappointed when I don't see my fellow faculty there. It's like, I see you know, a couple hundred of us, but how many faculty do we have at least on the main campus? The students love it to see you there. It sets them off on the right target. So if you can, come. That helps build that professional relationship. Finally, keep in mind that you are training your future colleagues and your future, uh, potentially future employees. So we're at the end, and luckily I've made the timing work out pretty well. So I wanted to revisit this initial thought. Be deliberate in your one-on-one -on -one interactions. I think if we understand the importance of being conscientious and thoughtful, directed, set personal goals, maintain expectations, give feedback, consider how our feedback affects our students, be available, and consider ways to reduce the barriers that impede those one-on-one -on -one instruction opportunities, we can really help set our students on the right track. By focusing on those goals and by being sensitive to student needs, student needs one instruction can, can really be of both the faculty and the students. I know my life is very enriched for the, for the times I've been able to share one-on-one -on -one with my students, and I hope that you are having the same, exp the same experiences. With that, I would like to ask, you, know, you all have many more, more years experience collectively. You have different experiences. Of course, I've not touched on large classes. That's not my personal experience. If you have anecdotes that you'd like to share, please find me during the day and share those with me. I'd like to add your insights and experiences to this larger body of work that I've talked about this morning. And I want to thank you so much for putting up with me and listening to me for the hour. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And finally, I'd like to thank our conference organizers for getting us off on, on a good start this morning. Thank you.